Hi, I'm Pastor Dave, and I serve as the Student Ministries Pastor at Brookhaven Wesleyan Church. Have you ever seen a child throw a temper tantrum? Perhaps they crinkle their nose or they pout. Maybe they cross their arms. Maybe they grumble instead of using words. Rah, 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 rah. In Genesis chapter 4, we read what is perhaps the first temper tantrum ever. And it's thrown not by a little child, but by a fully grown man named Cain. Cain and his brother Abel were both hard workers. Cain worked in the field raising crops, and Abel worked as a shepherd raising livestock. Both of them worked hard, and both of them brought sacrifices to God. Cain brought harvest from his fields, and Abel brought the firstborn of his flocks, the best that he had to offer to God. And God looked favorably on Abel's offering, the Bible tells us, but he looked unfavorably on Cain's offering. And Cain's response to this is to throw an adult-sized temper tantrum. The Bible tells us that Cain was gloomy and he was angry and he was angry at God. And God responds to Cain. He addresses this situation by posing two questions to Cain, two rhetorical questions. And in the first question, God poses a powerful promise. And in the second question, God poses a powerful warning. God approaches Cain and he says, Cain, why are you angry? Why are you dejected? If you do what is right, will you not be cheerful? If you do what is right, will you not be cheerful? But, God says, if you do not do what is right, sin is lurking at your door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And God puts these two pathways before Cain and gives him these two options and this promise. If you do what's right, you'll be cheerful, Cain. You know what's right, do what's right. But if you don't, sin is lurking, it's waiting for you, and you need to be a master over it. And so Cain is given these two options, and Cain deliberately chooses to go down the second path, and the very next verse he goes out and kills his brother Abel. As I was rereading this story this week, what stood out to me is the deliberate nature of Cain's decision. As a kid, I remember this story and remember thinking that it was kind of arbitrary, that Cain threw into a fit of rage one day and killed his brother Abel. And rereading it, I noticed that God very deliberately set out these options before Cain and said, Cain, you know what's right, do what's right. But if you do evil, here are gonna be the consequences of that. And even so, Cain decides to choose what is evil. And so these two options are put before him and Cain deliberately makes this choice. I've discovered at various points in my life, in my prayer life or my Bible reading, if I went through an extended period of time where I wasn't engaging in prayer, or I wasn't engaging with the Word of God, there created this, this distance between me and God. And as each day went by where I wasn't praying, or each day went by where I wasn't reading the Word, there was a distance. There was a shame and a guilt that came with that. And because of that shame and guilt or my own pride, it was harder to, to pick up the Word again. It was harder to engage in prayer. It was like there was a barrier there. As a youth pastor, I've shared that story with my students and every time I do, I see nods in the room or I see a look of recognition on their faces because I think that's a common experience people have if they get out of the habit of praying or they get out of the habit of reading their Bible, they feel that, that distance and it's hard to, to start again. And I think we can learn here from Abel's example, God invites us to offer a right sacrifice, to come before him. The Bible says that Abel came before God in faith and as an act of righteousness and offered a right sacrifice. And in contrast, it says that Cain's deeds were evil. A second thing I noticed from this story is that there is the nature of spiritual battle that is taking place. It wasn't merely a question of doing right, a question of doing wrong. In both cases, there are consequences for those decisions. God says, if you do what's right, you'll be cheerful. But Cain, if you don't do what's right, evil is lurking. Evil is waiting for you, and its desire is for you. And God puts these two choices before Cain, and there are consequences in each. Do what is right, or do what is evil, and evil begets more evil. As we continue in these 21 days of prayer, I want to encourage you to approach God like Abel did. Abel came before God in faithfulness, righteously offering a good sacrifice to God. The miracle of Christmas is that we're able to do that. We are now able to come directly before the throne of God freely and in all righteousness and pray before the throne of God, have a conversation with our God directly because of what Jesus has done 
for us. So I want to invite us to pray and offer sacrifices as Abel did, freely. The second thought or maybe challenge for you during this 21 days of prayer is to consider the very real spiritual nature of the battle that we are engaged in. We know that the Bible tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is in a spiritual realm. And when God warns Cain and says, if you do evil, sin is lurking for you. Sin is waiting for you, Cain. And it highlights the nature of our battle as we engage in prayer, that this is something bigger, not just a question of doing right and doing wrong, but the consequences thereof, the results of doing right, the results of engaging in a powerful prayer life, the results of neglecting or the results of doing evil. And so we are able to approach our God freely, faithfully as Abel did and engage in the spiritual battle in this way. I invite you today to join me in prayer and let us come before the Father freely today. God, we thank you that we are able to freely approach you, to come before you in all righteousness because of what Jesus has done for us. Lord, as we engage in these 21 days of prayer, help us to be like Abel, to come before you faithfully, righteously, to offer a right sacrifice in our prayers, in our praises, and in our daily lives, our daily actions, that we would live out each day in a manner that honors you, in a manner that glorifies you, in a manner that is doing what is right so that it will go well for us, so that we will be cheerful as we bring glory to God our Father. God, help us to remember to be aware that we are engaging in something that is bigger, that there is a spiritual battle at play. And as we engage in prayer, as we intercede for those around us, as we intercede for the world around us, as we lift up petitions and prayer requests to you, that we're engaging in a spiritual battle, that we are fighting for lives, fighting for souls in a spiritual realm. And there is, there are consequences for doing what is right. There are consequences for doing what is wrong. Help us to be aware of that and engage in our prayer life like it matters, like there are consequences for those things, God. Lord, thank you for the body of Christ that is able to come together and lift each other up in prayer and engage and fight together as a church body. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in this season as we engage together as fellow Christians, lifting one another up, praying for each other and praying for the world around us. Would you be glorified in everything, Lord, that we do, everything we say in our prayer lives and our actions this week. We ask these things in your name, amen. I invite you this week to continue in your prayer life, fighting fervently, faithfully and righteously like Abel did, and mastering sin, mastering over sin as God invited Cain to do, but Cain failed to do.